Now, if like me, you cannot drive across the Gold Star Memorial Bridge without sneaking a look out at the Thames River below, hoping for a glimpse of a submarine heading out into the Atlantic, then you're really going to enjoy our next speaker. Groton has been, long been the submarine capital of the world, now more than ever, as General Dynamics Electric Boat grows to meet U.S. Navy contracts for not one, but two classes of submarine, the Columbia and the Virginia class. And as a former member of the supply chain, I can tell you this is a once in a generation surge. With Electric Boat investing hundreds of millions of dollars into the supply chain, almost billions of dollars into its shipyard facilities, while adding thousands of new workers over the coming years. So how has the last year been in Groton? Here to make sense of it all, and to share his strategies for growing the company's workforce and supply chain, is our good friend, Kevin Graney, the president of General Dynamics Electric Boat. Kevin, good morning, thanks for joining us. Yeah, good morning, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. And um, uh, you, you, uh, you summarized it pretty well. We are in the midst of uh, once in a generation expansion, and frankly, it may be the biggest in our history. And uh, what we're doing right now is building two classes of submarines, the Columbia and the Virginia. And I'll spend a little time talking about that and provide you with um, an update on those programs, what we're doing in the facility. And the skyline here in Groton is changing. And uh, what we're doing to hire and train uh, the workforce necessary to do all that. Um, so uh, I thought it might be appropriate for us to do, uh, spend a few minutes on a, a video that we cut uh, for the end of 2021, that really kind of summarized uh, the, the last year in review. So, uh, so with that, let's go ahead and roll the video, and, uh, and then I'll pick up after that. For the last 14 years, Electric Boat has been planning, hiring, and building new facilities, so we're ready to execute on delivering one Columbia-class submarine and two Virginia-class submarines a year for the decades ahead. Specifically, General Dynamics has invested $1.8 billion for EV to modernize and upgrade our facilities. It's one thing to talk in big numbers, and while $1.8 billion is quite a number, it's another to see change happening before our eyes. At the start of 2021, the South Yard Assembly Building project team reached the important milestone of having completed the building's support structure. While the engineering and construction efforts since the beginning has been amazing to witness, a great deal had been accomplished at or below the water level. Now, as we close out 2021, the building's structural steel is in place, and we'll be watching the insulated panels that form the building's skin go up through early next year. Seeing this 200,000 square foot building take shape makes it real. We are all plank owners on the infrastructure that will employ many thousands of EB employees over multiple generations responsible for building, assembling, and testing the submarine that will carry 70% of our nation's nuclear deterrent. Many of those future shipbuilders have not even been born yet. The Columbia program will provide careers and economic stability for decades to come for our region and nationally to our suppliers. Our facility investments are also evident across the skyline at Quonset Point, where we've doubled our manufacturing footprint over the last several years. In June, we celebrated the completion of the 78,000 square foot Columbia Frame and Cylinder Building, known as AFC-2. This building is critical to Columbia's pressure hull construction. This year, we also broke ground and have continued construction on the Advanced Manufacturing Project, which will enable QP to build missile tubes critical to the success and effectiveness of the Columbia, Virginia, and all future submarine programs. In 2021, our facilities team did a great job preparing Quonset Point for the Ocean Transport Barge Holland, including dredging a new, wider, deeper channel in Narragansett Bay. The new channel will enable the barge to tie up and load Columbia modules for final assembly in Groton. On November 29th, Holland arrived in Groton after completing construction and sea trials at Bollinger Shipyards in Louisiana. Our fellow shipbuilders at Bollinger weathered Hurricane Ida to ensure Holland was delivered complete and on schedule. The barge will bring the large Columbia modules from Quonset to Groton for final assembly starting in 2023 and for many decades to come. Our Quonset Point team delivered 10 Virginia-class modules and five UK missile tubes. 2021 was a year of many firsts at Quonset Point. For the Virginia payload module, several hull cylinders are under construction and we completed our first evolutions through both VPM special fixtures the tube pairing fixture and the tube insertion fixture. 
The QP team will also complete the first Columbia quad pack by year's end. At Groton, it's been years since we've seen our gravy docks and wing walls so fully occupied. The Los Angeles class attack submarine USS Hartford arrived in Groton in June for its engineering overhaul. Over the course of 2021, the team conducted pre-work, what we call the smart start, to prepare for the maintenance availability that will begin in February of next year. USS Hartford is now docked in Graving Dock 2. This is an important project for Groton because it allows us to sustain our maintenance and modernization capability while we grow the team in preparation for Columbia. In July, we celebrated the christening of PCU-795, the Hyman G. Rickover, the 22nd ship of the Virginia class and the second submarine to be named for the father of our nuclear Navy. In September at Quonset Point, we marked the keel lane for PCU Utah, which will be the 28th ship of the Virginia class, SSN-801. October was a significant month as we completed the post shakedown availabilities for both the USS South Dakota and the USS Delaware. The Delaware team did a stellar job removing and replacing the bow dome, which was the first time we've ever done that job, along with much unanticipated work. The South Dakota's PSA included several enhancements that are firsts for the Virginia program and provide our Navy with game-changing capabilities that will continue to ensure our asymmetrical advantage over our adversaries. As we close 2021, PCU Oregon SSN 793 has completed Alpha Sea Trials in anticipation of her imminent delivery to the Navy. Along with supplying new submarines to our fleet, Electric Boat is refurbishing historic ship Nautilus, our nation's first nuclear-powered submarine, built by EB and commissioned in 1954. We're responding to the great power competition by evolving the Virginia submarine to accommodate a new mission and new capabilities. VPM will enable new weapons and payloads like hypersonic missiles, while SSW, a new mission area for submarines, is well underway in arrangements and procuring tactical mission hardware. Block 6 will bring new capabilities to the fleet, and this year we established the technical baseline for a range of new capabilities that ensure our ships maintain their undersea dominance and pave the way for SSNX, the next generation submarine. During the year, we continue to invest in our employees' development and grow the leaders of tomorrow. We added nearly 1,000 trade pipeline hires to our ranks and graduated more than 80 new apprentices. In addition, 2,300 employees graduated from our multiple programs that offer leadership development opportunities to employees at a variety of levels across our organization. The new year brings with it hope, optimism, and opportunity. While we can't predict the future or unexpected challenges we may face, I can predict with certainty that the men and women of Electric Boat will respond with a can-do spirit, an inventive mindset, and unwavering resolve. Our life's work really matters. To provide our nation with an unfair advantage that ensures future generations of Americans will know peace and freedom. I'm honored to be part of this team and to share in that collective legacy with you. Okay, well, um, hopefully uh, that gave you a good overview of uh, what we've been working on. And uh, I've got some charts uh, to go along with uh, my comments. So um, hopefully everybody can see those. And uh, um, can I get uh, chart three, please? Okay. So um, just to try and level set everybody, since I know not everybody uh, uh, builds submarines every day, I want to talk a little bit about our facilities and, and uh, really two major facilities uh, that make up electric boat. And uh, uh, we've got a electric boat facility here in Groton, Connecticut, which where, is where we do final assembly and test. Um, but we also have a, a facility, and you heard a little bit about that in the video, uh, up at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. And, and we've been building submarines this way. Uh, for about 25 years now, uh, and that is modularized construction of submarines. So the picture that you see, uh, we're trying to share there, I think on the uh, on the screen shows uh, a module we refer to as the 2B to 5 module. It's basically the middle of the submarine. Um, and uh, we build the rings and cylinders that form that submarine, and then we end load units into them. And what you see actually being end loaded is the habitability module for a Virginia class submarine, which makes up the, uh, the bathrooms, uh, the sleeping facilities, the bunks uh, for the crew, and, and some auxiliary equipment. Those modules for Virginia come down to Groton in four sections via a barge uh, from Quonset Point and from Newport News, Rhode Island. And what we do in Groton is we take those four 
and we, we weld the ends of that together to form the complete submarine. So that shows you how modern submarine construction takes place. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, talk a little bit about our lines of business, and you heard a little bit about that in the video, really four lines of business. Uh, first, which is really our bread and butter, is the Virginia-class design and construction. We've been building Virginia-class submarines now since 1997, uh, and we're about to deliver uh, the next one in that long line, uh, USS Oregon, in the in the next couple of weeks. And then I think just beyond that, you'll hear uh, from Newport News about delivery of uh, USS Montana. So uh, we've got some submarines uh, uh, building at any given time in our yard. We've got about 11, 12 submarines uh, between Quonset Point and Groton. Uh, and, and we've got a number of submarines being final assembly and tested down in Newport News as well. Columbia makes up a, an increasing part of our uh, business. Uh, that is a ballistic missile submarine that will replace the aging Ohio-class submarines in the coming years. And if you want to think about our business right now, about 60% of our business is Virginia. About 25% or so is Columbia. By the end of the decade, so in the next 10 years, um, our business from a revenue perspective will about double to roughly about $15 billion. Uh, and it'll be made up equally of Virginia-class submarines and ballistic missile submarines. While all that's going on, we also do maintenance and modernization. And you saw in the video, we, uh, we welcomed Hartford to the shipyard um, uh, last year. We're going through a, what's called a smart start right now prior to a significant engineering overhaul that'll keep that ship uh, next to the pier here in Groton for about the next three or four years. So it's an important uh, bit of work for us to do uh, in terms of getting uh, ships uh, back out to the fleet as quickly as possible. And then we've got about four or 5,000 people at any given time that work in our New London facility just across the river from us here in Groton doing other engineering and design work. And uh, some of that includes fleet support for all the classes of submarines that are currently operating. And we do a lot of concept and technology development. And uh, we're, we're currently in the process of doing concept studies for the next class of attack submarines known as SSNX. And that's forecast to begin construction in 2034. Before we go into more details, uh, I thought it would be appropriate to talk a little bit about why submarines are important. And, uh, um, and there, there's a lot to be worried about. The, the video referred to the Great Power Competition, which is a competition between the United States, Russia, and China. Um, and, and our submarines are on the pointy end of the spear uh, in, in terms of our response to, uh, to what Russia and China are doing. And, and specifically what we're doing is we're continuing to upgrade and evolve our Virginia platform to stay ahead of our adversaries. Recently, we completed a suite of upgrades uh, to uh, address the Russia challenge um, on, a, on a submarine. And, and this technology has now been tested at sea and will be built into all of the Block 5 submarines, which are submarines that are, uh, are, are under just begun construction, not yet, re yet fully assembled. And, and this is important as, as Russia continues to build what you see on the screen there, um, the, the Severodvinsk class, what we call affectionately the Sev class here, or the Yasin class of submarines. So they introduced a, a very capable submarine some years ago, and uh, now they've got another one, and uh, we expect to see more out in their fleet. Um, those ships have asymmetric capabilities, uh, like hypersonic missiles and uh, some very large nuclear-powered and nuclear-tipped torpedoes. Um, what I like to tell my folks here is that it's great to know that we're pushing, uh, we're pushing back against our adversaries. On the right-hand side, you see what uh, China is doing, and what that depicts is uh, some uh, open-source uh, uh, document uh, 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 or documentation of what they're uh, testing out in the deserts of China. Uh, and basically, you see a Nimitz-class carrier there in the uh, upper picture, and then the silhouette of it. And uh, they are developing hypersonic missiles designed to go right at U.S. Navy and allied surface ships. And so um, our submarines represent an asymmetric threat uh, to China as they continue to threaten uh, Taiwan as well. So combined, the threats of Russia and China are really sending a, a demand signal for uh, uh, more capable submarines and really defining the needs of our, of our sailors, our warfighters. For Russia, it's all about improved sensors, stealth, and longer range weapons. And for China, it's about speed to cover longer distances and more payload. Um, I want to mention also briefly that some of you may be familiar with a, uh, an announcement that took place this past September uh, regarding an alliance between Australia, the UK, and the US. We refer to that as AUKUS. 
that was announced in September. And that's all about uh, driving the potential for submarine, a, a nuclear submarine capability to Australia, again, to counter the China threat. Uh, so we're following these developments. Uh, and while we continue to stick to our knitting on both the Columbia and the Virginia programs, uh, and I think it'll be some time before Australia has a nuclear capability, but um, that sends yet another demand signal that'll require some additional investment across the submarine industrial base, which is our suppliers and, and of course, the shipyards. And it'll uh, significantly increase the demand for maintenance on the existing fleets uh, out there. So those threats represent a significant dem demand signal for the coming decades. I, I know everyone is sick about uh, talking about COVID, and uh, I'm, I'm sick of it too. But um, I think we need to acknowledge um, where we've been uh, first as a society, and then specifically what we've done at Electric Boat, um, because we are a significant part of the regional economy. Uh, we're not special. We've been impacted along with everyone listening. And I wanted to describe the path that we're on and, and what we think the future holds. Um, so uh, we, we put that ugly picture in the middle. Um, you know, I, I think um, two years ago, there wasn't too many people that I know that could, uh, did, you know, could tell you that, hey, that's a virus. Never mind the COVID virus. Uh, now a little bit uh, too familiar to all of us, I think. Um, from my perspective and, and, uh, and, and the people of Electric Boat, it's been about safety. Um, safety is always and is going to continue to be our number one priority. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that in spite of COVID, and, and even with hiring thousands of people in the last year, we saw another record-setting year in terms of our OSHA reportable and lost workday rates here at Electric Boat, about a 22% reduction since 2019 when I took the helm. Our safety of performance is the best in our history. And, and, and as I said, as we address COVID, safety remained first and foremost. Um, with regard to COVID, we remained an essential business and we continue to stay operational. We're currently about 86% vaccinated here and we did that without invoking a vaccine mandate. And that was particularly important um, because I think as many people know, there were a number of people uh, who may have left the business uh, had, had we invoked that mandate, we would have lost a significant portion of our workforce, uh, a, a portion that we couldn't afford to lose. And so we took uh, kind of a carrot approach rather than a stick approach, and I'm pleased to report where we are with regard to the vaccine mandate today. Um, more recently, and since uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Omicron has been uh, uh, you know ravaging Connecticut, I think, as everybody knows. And uh, here at EB, we're no different. About 40% of our cases all time since the beginning of the pandemic have occurred in the last eight weeks. And it's been a, a little bit more of a disproportionate impact on the leadership, uh, particularly since we've returned from our Christmas, uh, traditional Christmas shutdown. We're starting to see that moderate. Uh, and, it's, uh, uh, and, and as it's been since the beginning, the infection rate here at Electric Boat is mirrored uh, in the surrounding regions. Um, what we're seeing as a result of coming out of COVID if we can make that claim yet, uh, is a decline in our productivity caused by pa uh, pandemic-related absenteeism and reduced efficiency. And our suppliers and our partners experience the same COVID-related challenges and we're hard, working hard to reduce uh, with respect to, particularly with respect to schedule impacts. Going forward, hiring is our biggest issue. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in an upcoming slide. We stopped training for about a six month period in 2020 and we opened the training pipelines in 2020 and 2021 um, while keeping uh, uh, social distancing and all the protocols associated with COVID. So it was a little less efficient getting people in the classroom and getting them trained. Um, we've seen higher attrition uh, as a result of our business, um, a lot of retirements uh, and uh, you know what, what people now are referring to as the great resignation. So we're seeing that impact as well. And simply put, it's getting harder to hire and retain employees, and we're working harder than ever uh, to, to make that uh, growth trajectory uh, that uh, we're, uh, uh, we're on. Um, we're also seeing some less willingness to work overtime, and, and uh, we're all experiencing wage pressure. And while I think uh, shipbuilding jobs are very, very attractive and important to our regional economy uh, relative to the service sector, the delta between um, our, our jobs uh, here at the shipyard and the rest of the economy uh, has narrowed uh, in, the, in the last uh, you know, six months to a year. So we're adjusting to that and we're gonna continue to, to adjust to 
make sure we fulfill our commitment to our, uh, our Navy customer. So I'd like to describe a little bit about each of our submarine programs in brief. You saw some of that in the video. Um, and we'll begin with the Columbia program. Um, our Columbia program is in full uh, scale production right now. Uh, and again, this is the thing, uh, the, the, the ship that will replace the uh, Ohio class submarines as uh, the backbone of our nation's strategic deterrent. So 70% of the uh, weapons that uh, form our strategic deterrent are carried in submarines. We're going to build 12 ships uh, to be SSBNs, and I think that class will actually be expanded over time. Uh, so that ship will be uh, delivered beginning in uh, uh, 2027, and we'll be building out the Columbia class through 2040. And think about this, those ships will be in existence protecting uh, our nation and the rest of the world into the 2080s. Um, this is arguably uh, the, the greatest engineering achievement of the most advanced military in the world. Uh, the propulsion motor on this ship alone is the size of a basketball court. And uh, we've completed the bulk of propulsion motor testing on the ship with very good results. And the lead ship motor is on track to deliver to support our construction need date. Um, we're in full scale construct construction and the curve that you see on the chart represents where we are compared to Virginia at the same time. So we're about 14 months ahead of the lead Virginia and that's the result of a significant effort to go get the design more completed construction start, get the material available at construction start and do a lot with advanced construction. So we're making great progress on the program uh, in spite of the COVID challenges I talked about earlier. And we'll continue to work hard to make sure we stay ahead of that Virginia curve and, and, and meet our delivery date. Uh, next, please. So Virginia program is uh, uh, something that we've been building since uh, about uh, 1997. Uh, we're currently contracted through what we call block five and a block is typically about 10 ships. So uh, right now under contract, 38 ships, 19 of those ships have been delivered and we're currently building block four, uh, which includes an additional nine ships yet to be delivered and uh, block five, which includes that 10 ship block I referred to. Our Virginia class submarine program is evolving and you see in the uh, center there how it's evolved over time to accomplish new missions. And we're taking the existing hull form and modifying that to incorporate new weapons, sensors, and improved stealth features. Um, one of the most significant design changes we've implemented uh, um, in, uh, in recent times and, and currently ongoing is the Virginia payload module which will, will carry an enhanced strike capability. You see that in the second submarine there from the uh, top, uh, basically an 84 foot hull section that includes four additional missile tubes. Uh, and that design will actually uh, replace some of the guided missile submarines or SSGNs that are operating in the fleet as they age out. We're developing in the, that third picture, a seabed warfare variant. Uh, and this ship is designed to interact with the seafloor and this design will repurpose some of those missile tubes that uh, I referred to in the VPM uh, design to perform those missions. And at the bottom, you see block six. Really, that will become the jumping off point, we think, for the SSNX program. And we expect to continue to incorporate even more advanced stealth and performance features. This slide is uh, just intended to show some of the accomplishments from 2021. You saw some of those in the video um, where we delivered the first uh, Block 4 submarine in uh, April of 2020. And I expect we'll deliver PCU Oregon. This is the second in the uh, uh, Block 4 uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So we went through sea trials. I was fortunate enough to ride that uh, boat on sea trials and uh, the ship performed uh, exceptionally well. We rolled out um, the fourth Block 4 submarine known as the Hyman G Rickover. That's the 795 boat here. And that took place last July. That ship is now in the water and delivery is planned later in the year. And then you see a couple of other boats, the 797, where we're pressure hull complete. And uh, we've laid the keel for the 801. So we've got a number uh, throughout the Block 4. All of those ships are in, under construction and we're about three or four hulls into construction on Block 5. So many hulls under construction currently on Virginia. Beyond new construction is maintenance and modernization. Uh, the video talked a little bit about the US Har USS Hartford here in the yard. She'll be here for about the next three or four years going through some significant engineering overhaul work. And then most recently, 
uh, we uh, we took the USS Nautilus, the museum ship that's down here in Groton. We moved that back up to the sub base. She's now in dry dock. You see her actually entering dry dock there on the picture on the uh, right hand side. Uh, and she's going through some uh, some paint and refurbishment so that she can continue to, to perform her mission as a museum ship, educating the people of Connecticut about submarines uh, for the coming decades. Um, we expect that to be back at the uh, uh, museum uh, in the summer of, uh, of this year. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, on the waterfront with regard to maintenance and modernization. Our waterfront is very busy. Um, the docks are full, um, the wing walls are full. We've got a lot of boats uh, coming and going at any given time. We redelivered the USS South Dakota uh, and the USS Delaware last year. And the, the uh, South Dakota uh, modernized that, that vessel featuring some enha enhancements that are first for the Virginia program. And that ship is now out uh, in, in uh, uh, operational. And uh, I've talked to the, uh, to the Navy leaders and what they'll tell you is uh, what we put on that boat and what our capabilities are is, is to quote them game changing. Um, and then uh, we've got uh, Vermont in here today and we'll are uh, currently in here and uh, we'll schedule to complete her in the summertime. So you can get a sense of the pace of operations here, particularly in Connecticut. The video also talked about some of our expansion and uh, I won't go through this in too much detail since you saw some of it in uh, some of those pictures in the video, I thought uh, did some justice as to how big the facilities are. Um, we, we mentioned earlier how the Groton skyline is changing and our South Yard Assembly Building is, uh, is a significant contributor to that. So that is where the Columbia modules will come and we'll uh, complete final assembly and test and we'll move them out of the building onto a floating dry dock known as the Atlas. And then we'll sink that dry dock down into the uh, uh, Thames River here and launch the uh, Columbia from it. Uh, in order to get the piece parts and, and the modules from uh, uh, from the various locations across the country that provide them to us, including Quonset and Newport News, uh, and the modules themselves for Columbia, we're going to be using the Holland, which is our ocean transport barge. So it's the largest barge that we've ever used to assemble submarines. And it's large because the uh, units coming from uh, elsewhere to Groton are the biggest we've ever assembled in our history. There's some other buildings that you see there, our nuclear support building and our pre-commissioning unit building that we are under construction on and expect to complete. Uh, in in uh, uh, within about the year. So let's talk a little bit about recruiting, hiring, and training. Uh, last year we we hired more than twenty five hundred people, and if you think about the uh, the mix of that, uh, about two thirds of them were in operations. So these are welders, fitters, um, pipe mechanics, electricians, uh, the guys who actually touch the work and and go put it together on a routine basis. And the remaining hires, about a third of of everybody we brought in uh, were engineers and designers, and the rest were in support functions. Uh, half of our new hires in 2021 were for positions here in the state of Connecticut. Um, and we're continuing to hire, particularly here in Connecticut, to support the Hartford that we talked about. Uh, we've got a number of people, uh, 92 so far, that have started this year, and that's really just the beginning. I think we're going to be uh, about 400 people additional uh, in, in Groton just this year. And that I expect to continue. So that maintenance and modernization uh, effort that we do will actually be the springboard for bringing people into the business as Columbia modules arrive and we get, begin to do the final assembly and test on them. One of the things I'm excited about is what we've been doing with regard to diversity and, in, and inclusion here. And uh, since December 2020, so just about a year now, a little over a year now, we've seen an 11% increase in, a, in our minority population. And notable in that is a 19% increase in our Hispanic population. Uh, we've also, in, in a business that has traditionally been dominated by men, uh, we're seeing a significant increase in the women in, in, in our business in senior leadership positions. And women now constitute about 16% of EB senior leaders. And, uh, and, and all of that effort, I think, is making us a much more effective team. And uh, we're, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to, to see that. Uh, you saw on the video a couple of... Uh, our, our female uh, uh, managers uh, working at Quonset Point. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, first time in my career, uh, I walked out about a month ago and I had uh, four female uh, leaders uh, briefing me um, on, uh, on how we're doing with the VPM module. And that is rare in our business. And I was thrilled to see it. And they did a fantastic job. Uh, so I can't wait 
uh, to continue to develop our, 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 our female workforce. So we've got a couple of things that we're doing uh, with that to help. Well, we've got a program called Vote for Women. This is an opportunity to uh, expose uh, women who are thinking about uh, uh, a job here at, uh, at Electric Boat to the trades and to try and knock down some of those perceived barriers that I think have traditionally uh, existed in our business. Uh, we're also working a lot with veterans and trying to get our veterans uh, in here. Uh, so we've got a Boat for Vets program. And I talked a little bit about our Hispanic population. We've got uh, what we call Barco for our Spanish uh, speakers uh, in development. Uh, our need to hire is persistent and it's gonna be long-term. On Monday, I get an opportunity to give my uh, annual legislative briefing and I'll provide an update on our key programs and, and facility expansions, much like today. And I'll also reveal our hiring goal, goals for 2022. It's significant. Uh, to meet our goals, we need to introduce careers, uh, our careers to those who don't yet know they want to be shipbuilders. Uh, we're increasing our out outreach to non-traditional populations in, in underserved communities, as I previously talked about. And we've got school programs on all levels from elementary to high school. And, and what we're trying to do is expose people to the trades and, and to build awareness for careers here at Electric Boat, not just jobs, not just this gig economy that a lot of people like to talk about, but longstanding, decades-long, highly skilled careers and, and ample opportunity for significant promotion uh, uh, over time, given the workload that we have. Uh, some of you may have seen us do some things we've never done before, TV advertising. So uh, um, I, I'm, I'm after my communications people all the time. I don't want to watch a football game. Uh, without seeing a, an electric boat uh, advertisement. And hopefully you guys are seeing those and, and uh, uh, telling your friends. Uh, our goal here is to attract and retain employees by providing opportunities for those long-term careers and continued skill development. So I can't do it alone. Um, we need everybody listening's help. Spread the word. Electric boat is hiring. And if you can fit or weld, come on down. We'll give you a job audition. We are the largest private employer in the state of Connecticut uh, and Rhode Island, so about 18,000 employees. 62% uh, of our employees are Connecticut residents, and the remainder are, are uh, Rhode Island residents. We're doing a lot of work uh, regionally uh, with some tremendous, tremendous uh, effort by uh, our state and our, our federal legislators, uh, providing us with the means to stay end up some of these training pipelines, such as the Eastern Workforce Investment Board or EWIB. Uh, you see some of the folks that we're working with there on, on the screen. And, and uh, uh, in uh, 2021, about two thirds of the people going through those programs have come, come to EB. The remainder are going to the rest of the manufacturing uh, businesses here in the state of Connecticut. And we, we foresee uh, that continuing uh, for as far out as, as, as we can see. I think it's gonna be another couple of decades. Um, these programs are uh, tremendous. Uh, they're a source of, of new skilled workers for us. And as I mentioned, suppliers from across the, the state. Um, and they provide uh, everybody who participates in them the opportunity to learn a skill. And, and I think all of those skills uh, provide a lifetime of employment and advancement opportunity, uh, especially given the, the workload we have ahead of us. So not only uh, do we have uh, programs to help uh, our underemployed adults transition uh, to electric boat. We've also got uh, school programs at all levels. And I mentioned elementary to high school. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, why are we doing this? Uh, 2033 is projected to be one of our peak years of hiring. So we are in the runoff to 2033 starting now. Many of the people that we hire uh, that year will just be graduating from high school. And uh, as we mentioned in the video, some of them uh, you know, that, that'll end up joining our workforce eventually aren't even born yet. And so getting out there and, and educating people about the opportunities here at EB is, is incredibly important to us uh, right now. Over the last five years, um, approximately $22 billion uh, has been awarded to 2,600 suppliers in 47 states in our nation. Um, during the same time, $1.1 billion right here in Connecticut across 359 suppliers uh, and that's across the state, all of the congressional districts. Um, I can't say enough thanks to our federal delegation um, for the congressional support that we get, uh, as well as the support we get from our state legislature. Um, and we got uh, an additional $130 million in, in FY21 to be able to go 
uh, provide seed money in the industrial base uh, to help with uh, developing our, our, our supply chain. The money is making a difference and over 90% of the industrial base right now is currently prepared for a current and future demand. That remaining 10% is something that we're spending a lot of time and effort making sure that they are preparing and getting ready to support the work we have. A couple examples right here in Connecticut, um, LM Gill, which is a company located in Manchester, was awarded $2.2 million in a purchase order to upgrade some of their machining equipment and, 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 uh, and, and, and to help increase their welding capacity. Uh, BNF Machine, which is in New Britain, Connecticut, awarded $9.1 million uh, to buy some specialized machining equipment. So, so that money is coming home here to Connecticut, and, and we, can, we will continue to, to uh, be good stewards of that, making sure that uh, the industrial base is keeping up with uh, the demand. We're also continuing to focus on strategic sourcing efforts and strategic sourcing is something that uh, is increasingly important. This is bringing new suppliers into the business to do some of the work that has been uh, a baseline skill for electric boat in the past. So think about welding large structures uh, that, that we typically do here at EB. We're now expanding out into having others do that. We're doing it because the footprint demands on some of that stuff uh, is greater than we have capacity for. And so spreading some of that workload across uh, some new players in the industrial base is key for us. The other aspect of strategic sourcing is the fact, and we talked a little bit about how difficult it is hiring folks uh, right now. Um, uh, we're taking advantage of, um, uh, of labor resources from outside our, our, our region right now to help us with that. And so a couple of reasons for a, a big focus on what we refer to as strategic sourcing. Um, and we're continuing to do that by outsourcing that work um, and along with it, embedding EB personnel in our quality management system along with them. So we talk about it as sending a team to build a team at some of these non-traditional suppliers. And that work I think is gonna continue. It's also a great uh, opportunity for anybody listening who's got uh, a welding, uh, or uh, machining or uh, you know, manufacturing capability in Connecticut that we, uh, we haven't yet found. Uh, so please feel free to contact us and, and, and we'll be happy to talk with you. So as, as we close, I, I, I wanna provide you with uh, what I think is a great picture. Um, and it really, for me, symbolizes where EB is heading. Um, we are, uh, we've got a very robust uh, future. We're, we're heading off into a new dawn um, and, uh, and, and the picture that you see here was uh, USS Oregon. That's a ship that uh, completed sea trials and, and uh, we expect to deliver here in the coming weeks. Um, so um, for me, uh, that spoke a lot about you know, where we are. It's our latest contribution to our nation's defense and it's being operated for the first time by her crew and the EB experts um, who, who built her. Um, so uh, it's it's great to be uh, part of that experience and to be able to sail these boats to sea for the first time. As, as some of you may know, I was a submariner. I still am at heart. And uh, as the president of Electric Boat, um, I have the privilege of, of riding every boat we deliver. And I can't think of a better job, Perk. Uh, I wish every American, every citizen in Connecticut, and every member of the EB team could see what I see on those ships. And what I see is just eye-watering technology. Uh, sailors who are completely dedicated and masters at submarine warfare, and it's EB people who are fiercely proud of what we build. Um, I left EB in, in 2005 to work for another General Dynamics uh, shipyard out in San Diego. Um, and when I returned after 14 years, you know, I saw some of the same faces. Some of them were a little grayer. Some of them were a little older. I wasn't, but everybody else was. Uh, and our core business was, was and is still the same. But the place is different. There's a different energy here. Um, we've got uh, new people coming in. Our workforce is changing. It is younger. Uh, they are hungry for the work that we are doing. And, and we are working hard to, to bring in and, and train the next generation of, of, of shipbuilders. That generation doesn't look like my generation. They come from different backgrounds with exceptionally unique skills, and they're bringing great new perspectives to our company. So like the Oregon and her crew, we're moving out together into our future with a mission that I think is truly worthwhile, and that's to make the world safer uh, for the next generation. Um, those of you who know me um, know I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, and for anybody who's a Patriot fan, 
Um, sorry, not sorry for last week. Uh, after two decades of beatdowns, um, you kind of earned that one. Um, but from my perspective, and that's not my point, from my perspective, uh, one of the great coaches of the Buffalo Bills was uh, Marv Levy in the Hall of Fame today. And uh, he would he would talk to his team before uh, the big games, and he would say, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? And so I ask you, where else would you rather be than right here, right now in the great state of Connecticut, building submarines and having a significant impact on our regional economy? So if you remember anything I said today, um, just remember this. EB, and, and this is a company that designs and builds the most complex machines on the planet, is looking for people who want to join a company with a great history, a strong future, and a very noble mission. So come on and join us. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Kevin. That was a great overview. Lots of exciting things happening in Groton, Connecticut, really in our country. And clearly the message is EB is hiring. And so if folks are looking, I know you guys are trying to grow. What, one quick question, because a lot of businesses in Connecticut look to what EB is doing around workforce, because you have such a workforce challenge that is, that is magnified. I know I was in the supply chain years, years back in my prior life. And at one point, 17,000 new jobs needed to be, uh, or employees needed to come into EB over the next 10 years. What you talked about the MPI program, 1,400 new folks coming in almost last year alone. Incredible testament to collaboration. What else is EB doing around workforce from the soft skills side, maybe to keep the workforce you have or to attract new, uh, new employees at the electric boat? Yeah, we're, we're doing quite a bit. And uh, I, I think the, the thing that has a, a big bang for the buck is, is what we're doing with our, um, with our supervision. Um, we've got a lot of new supervisors and, uh, you know, if, if those of you in a manufacturing environment know if you've got a bad supervisor and that, that supervisor impacts 12 or 15 people a day, you've got 12 or 15, uh, uh, people's worth of work that you, maybe you got to rework. And so getting to our operations supervisor, those first line and second line, uh, leaders, uh, and making sure they're as proficient as they can be at their trade skill. Um, but also in those soft skills that you talked about, what we're doing to, uh, to lead people uh, and get them to be, get the most out of them uh, in every given, given day is, is important. So how to make them good businessmen and women, how to make them inspirational leaders, and how to make sure that they understand uh, what's important every day and, and are conveying that and communicating that effectively to the people around us. So that's work that we began uh, two years ago. Uh, we've graduated hundreds of people through uh, what we call our deck plate leader development program. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, it, we, we've worked hard with uh, the resources in Connecticut as well as Rhode Island to, to stand up. And I think it's starting to pay some dividends. We've got some great young leaders in this business uh, who I think are, are going to get just better uh, as we get more sets and reps under their belt uh, with regard to the work that we're doing. Thanks. So take a page from EB if you want to grow your workforce. Kevin, thanks so much again for your time this morning. Electric Boat is a key part of Connecticut's rich legacy of innovation, and it's clear that you're continuing to redefine that history. We look forward to watching those boats roll off the swipways for years to come. Thank you. The Metro Hartford Alliance is a valuable partner for CBIA and plays an essential role in promoting and driving economic growth in the greater Hartford area. There's growing confidence among business leaders and real collaboration between public and private sectors driving investment in the city, a model for other cities in Connecticut, an important lesson. As go our cities, goes our state. Here's my good friend, David Griggs, the Alliance president and CEO. Good morning, David. Good morning. Imagine it was just two years ago that we all met together under one roof in downtown Hartford. Take a moment and think about how much you've had to change and adapt to survive. Congratulations to each of you for your perseverance to overcome everything these last two years have thrown at you. One thing that hasn't changed, however, is the amount of time I'm given to close out the, this event, on at 11.45 and at 11.45. So with my remaining time, I would like to thank our highly respected panelists and, and speakers for today's event. Also, a very special thank you to John Ciula and Webster Bank for their sponsorship of today's event. 
There's been an incredible amount of information shared with you today. So I encourage you to go to the CBI web, CBIA website and take a look at their legislative agenda. There will also be a replay of today's event for you to replay and take a look at all of the information shared. And while you're online, take a stop by metrohartford.com and take a look at some of the initiatives that we have going on, like the Heartlift Program, a collaboration between the City of Hartford and the Hartford Chamber of Commerce to reactivate our restaurant and retail scene right here in Hartford using over $6 million of ARPA funds. While you're online, take a look at weareallheart.com, another initiative, a concept of the Alliance, a talent attraction campaign designed to help you, our businesses, attract the talent you need to survive. And finally, keep telling your Hartford story. We are growing our residential base and we need to continue. You are our best salesperson. And until we meet again, thank you for attending. Be safe, stay healthy, and do good work.